Ale with, with, with these. Okay. Good morning, colleagues. We will start in five minutes. Please uh, forgive us the, uh, the delay. We will start in five minutes, waiting for colleagues to join us. Five minutes. Why don't you come over yes, here? <laughs> Excellent. Okay. No worries. I will wait for you. <laughs> 
Buenos dias, good morning, bonjour. We are waiting for our last star, our last panelist, and uh, uh, we'll start. Uh, just to say that uh, this session we have uh, three languages, uh, English, Spanish, and French, and uh, uh, we are having uh, eminent speakers who uh, will be presenting later in, in the panel discussion. My name is uh, Boran Shakrun. I'm director for Division for Policy and Lifelong Learning Systems at UNESCO headquarters, and uh, I'm very pleased to open uh, this roundtable on uh, new approaches to the right to higher education. Dear colleagues, the world has come uh, a long way from the previous focus on universal basic education with the adoption of the 1960 Convention on the, Against the Discrimination of, uh, on Education. With the adoption of the SDG4 Education 2030 Agenda, it was grounded in human rights, lifelong learning perspective, and acknowledging that learning starts at early uh, ages and continue throughout life. Life happens in different learning settings, in different manners, formal, non-formal and informal, physically, but also uh, virtually. Yet, the educational landscape is evolving, and new challenges, new opportunities, and actors are emerging. Digital transformation, climate change, demographic transition, social cohesion, and the uncertainty of future of work are having a growing impact on all levels of education. As well as, as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has also shaken the foundation of education systems, revealing the fragility of the delivery of education in time of crisis. COVID-19 is a wake-up call, but the challenges were before the COVID. We had new challenges that were emerging, but we had also challenges that were there before the COVID, and some of them are related to the learning crisis, are related to aspects on higher level of dropouts, access to uh, basic education or access to different levels of education. And these are challenges that we have to uh, cope with. Against this backdrop, education, a fundamental human right, is being threatened. Faced with these concerns, UNESCO launched a reflection on the evolving dimension of the right to education to better respond to these current needs, but also in light of future challenges. Just to mention some of them, this conference on the uh, higher education, but we have also a conference mid-June on uh, adult learning and education, what we call CONFINTIA, we are engaged in transforming education uh, agenda. In November, we have a conference on early child learning. It's about lifelong learning perspective. And today, we are discussing, of course, higher education. But we have to place the discussion in this uh, perspective of lifelong learning. So as part of this broader initiative that we have launched, higher education deserves particular attention. While higher education has known a remarkable expansion, with enrollment rates doubling in the past two decades. Challenges with regard to access, participation, completion persist, and in some cases have been exacerbated in recent years. More must be done to ensure equality of opportunities. Higher education is too often limited to those with agency. And to be provocative, it is framed within a false meritocracy lens, and I think we need to discuss this. Dear colleagues, progress in the last uh, years on, in terms of understanding uh, the cognitive development, neurosciences, other research and, and uh, science perspective, provide us that right to education and right to learning and the problems start from early, early years. Education opportunities are unequally distributed, embedded direct and indirect discrimination, deferring socioeconomic backgrounds, a lack of cultural capital results in skewed admission procedures in higher education. Moreover, in both developed and developing countries, high tuition fees, which are further compounded by indirect fees, place a heavy financial burden on family, particularly from socioeconom low socioeconomic background, from ethnic minorities, from disadvantaged groups. Beyond access, once enrolled students from disadvantaged group and background struggle to succeed in completion, completing higher education due to lack of flexibility in learning pathways and of inclusive uh, policy measures. And in some cases, even not understanding how to succeed in higher education, because they don't have the keys to, to, for that. 
yet higher education provides individuals with opportunities to specialize in knowledge and skills which in turn allows fee for the realization of their rights to decent work. Higher education also enables personal development and promote exchange of knowledge, research, and innovation with benefit, which benefits society as a whole. But higher education is also central for international cooperation and international solidarity, and it's very important. And the conference like ours is part of, of that. UNESCO and ISALC have therefore been working to stimulate the base on the right to higher education, as there is an urgent need to further recontextualize the right to higher education and to bring career greater clarity and guidance in advancing this right within a lifelong learning perspective, as I explained. So I'm confident that uh, with the discussion we'll have, the panelists, but also the audience, we will have views and insight we'll further, which will further in, uh, enrich our important work and help us envisage how we can drive this agenda and how we can adv advance the, uh, the evolving right to education agenda. With that, I would like to, p to pass the floor to my colleagues, Emma Sabzalieva from UNESCO ISALC and uh, Rola Mumne from uh, UNESCO headquarters, who will uh, launch the two new reports on the right to higher education, the right to higher education unpacking the international normative framework in light of current trends and challenges, and the right to higher education, a social justice perspective. These are, I would say, a framework that can build together a, a good agenda for us to advance uh, the right to higher education going forward and as part of the roadmap to, uh, that we are adopting uh, in, during this conference. Let me give the floor to first um, Emma and then uh, Rola to uh, guide us, please. Thank you very much, uh, Boren Chakroum, for your opening remarks. A very warm welcome to the session today. This is an example of UNESCO cooperation in practice. Um, so we're thrilled to be able to talk to you today about uh, the topic of new approaches to the right to higher education, so eloquently introduced for us by Boren. Uh, we just remind you again, colleagues, that in the course of the session today, we will draw on all three of the languages, English, French, and Spanish, that are available. So if you'd like to get a headset, uh, we're going to do the presentation in English. After that, we may switch, so um, just so that everybody can, can keep up and we can uh, really make use of the, the, the multi-language opportunity. So let's start a little bit by thinking about what global progress have we made on the right to higher education. Um, and this is an illustration from some work published by UNESCO ESALC uh, last year uh, called Towards Universal Access. So we know that globally between 2000 and 2018, gross enrollment ratios increased around the world from 19 to 38%. And I think you're probably familiar with that doubling of the figure. It's quite astonishing and it's very impressive in its way. We know that as a result, access to, access to education has dramatically increased. Rates of illiteracy have plummeted. Opportunities to embark on lifelong learning have greatly expanded with people living longer, and the nature of work is shifting. We also know when we think about this in global perspective, that well over five million students are pursuing further education abroad. Of course, with the pandemic, there's gonna be some disruption with that. And as a whole, when we think about these various systems of higher education, we see greater diversity in provision, in student mobility, in research dynamics, and in innovation. But if you're looking at the map that you see on the slide behind you, you'll see that we have many challenges remaining. So yes, overall enrollment, if we take it at a, at a, a global level, is almost 40%. But actually, you'll see from here that we have large differences between countries and regions. So while we, want, while we want to celebrate the progress that's been made, we also want to stop and think about some of the challenges that remain. And we know that access to higher education remains unequal. If you come from a less well-off background, you are far less likely to get into higher education. We know, and you can see from the graph here, only 10% of those from the lowest income enroll compared to 77% from the highest income groups. So we've got a long way that we still need to go. And one of the things that we hope to be able to do today is to think about this from this rights-based perspective. Thank you. Um, as Emma mentioned, inequalities really uh, remain uh, important uh, today. And uh, in addition to the fact that uh, there are uh, large differences between countries and regions, in terms of uh, um, uh, overall enrollment uh, ratio, 
uh, only uh, 1% of the poorest complete four years of uh, higher education, but also when it comes to displacement, uh, only 5% of uh, eligible uh, refugees uh, have, uh, have access and are enrolled. Uh, so we know also that uh, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, further disrupted uh, the education of millions of, uh, uh, of tertiary uh, students. So there is really today a need to clearly stipulate uh, that uh, there is an indisputable right to higher education with concrete, clear uh, legal uh, obligations. We have the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which stipulates obligation very clearly, but we have also specific instruments at international and, and regional uh, level that really form a framework uh, providing the legal foundations. And uh, also, Education uh, 2030 uh, gave a new impetus to higher education and the right to higher education. But despite all these uh, commitments and, and obligations, several implementation challenges and, gap, and gaps have been uh, really uh, revealed, and notably um, by the United Nations human rights bodies, uh, who highlighted these uh, uh, challenges and raised concern about uh, the, the gaps when it comes to application and enrollment phase, but also during uh, the studies and in the transition uh, uh, to the labor market. So it is in this uh, context that uh, we elaborated a policy uh, paper with Right, to, educa right to, to Education Initiative, the organization, to examine how uh, these human rights uh, obligations and principles actually uh, apply in today's uh, context and uh, also based on the findings, we uh, are um, formulating some recommendations. We have um, a preprint version of, of, this, uh, of this report. Uh, there are some copies which are made available today. It's, um, it's a preprint, so meaning it's not a finalized document uh, because we really are, are expecting that the, the discussions today and during the conference will be able um, and help us to, uh, to fine tune the content of, of, this, uh, of this report. And this report is conceived as a complementary to the conceptual research paper uh, that has been elaborated by uh, UNESCO ESALC. And now I will uh, give the floor back to Emma to present this conceptual policy research paper, and I will then present uh, the findings of, of this policy paper. Thanks, Rola. Um, so our paper, The Right to Higher Education, a Social Justice Perspective, is live. Um, so this is the official launch. You heard it here first. Um, you can access a copy. Unfortunately, I don't have print ones with me, but we do have it electronically on the UNESCO ESL website. We'll be putting it forward in our social media as well. We currently have the English version and the executive summary available in Spanish, which is the other working language of our institute, and the full version of the report in Spanish is forthcoming. So in our paper, which is more of a conceptual paper, and I appreciate that that's not necessarily something you might expect from UNESCO, so this is another reason why we feel that these two papers really come together to complement as we move forward and think about the right to higher education. So in this, we examine existing research on the right to higher education, but we take a systemic and a structural outlook on the issues that are facing students in higher education today. So what I want to just highlight from that is the framework. This is a new social justice-driven framework that we developed um, and have included in the report in this kind of visual format here. So what you can see, and I'm going to resist the urge to go and stand next to the screen and, and sort of point at each part of it, but you see on the outside of the circle, we've taken up the, the five A's framework. It's availability, accessibility, <laughs> Thank you. Adaptability, adaptability, accountability. accountability, I think I'm just sort of trying to read all the A's at the same time. These focus on the human rights obligations of all states to make education available, accessible, acceptable, adaptable, and accountable. Thank you. The principles connect to the broader rights frameworks that Roller also just mentioned. And they set a kind of macro level environment for the framework that we've created. So it, within this framework, the right to higher education exists. So then what we have done is taken up this idea of inclusive excellence. So you see that kind of in the next ring inside. And that's really because we're thinking about higher education. This gives higher education institutions the impetus to make purposeful changes that have a positive impact on student achievement and well-being. So it helps us to focus on actions that need to be taken by institutional leaders, by staff, um, and by all those who are working within institutions. So we're thinking here kind of more about the institution, the policy dimension. 
And then within that, what you see as well on the diagram is a series of interconnected shapes here. And so each represents what we're calling equity deserving groups. So equity deserving groups uh, is a term that uh, Wisdom Tetty, the Chancellor of University of Toronto in Canada, has come up with to really help us focus on students because it's students who are at the center of all our considerations of the right to higher education. And we use the term to kind of shift our focus away a little bit from the student somehow being a deficit and it being the student's responsibility to fix themselves in order to fit, fit into higher education. So we hope but by sort of using this and introducing this idea, it kind of flips around to help us think about the structures underpinning that that need to change. And the other dimension that we have in the framework is intersectionality. So it's represented on the diagram here with the dotted lines. So many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Crenshaw's concept of intersectionality. So the idea here is to ensure that we don't just think about one equity-deserving group as existing sort of on its own in some kind of silo, but we really understand and, and grapple with the complexity uh, that that brings forward. That's the framework that we put forward here. Um, and through the paper, you'll see that we sort of break these down into the different functions of higher education and talk about how that might be operationalized on a sort of conceptual level. How we might put that framework into action, I'm just going to briefly mention these. But as I've mentioned, because of this sort of systemic approach that we take, what that will require us to do is to transform institutional structures. So as I mentioned, that we put students, we really put students at the heart of higher education. It sounds obvious when I say it now, but it's actually not something that's taken for granted. We need to start with quality school education because, as Boran mentioned in his opening remarks, it's that pipeline that's created as we go through into higher education. And we need to stop that pipeline from narrowing by the time that students don't or do reach higher education. We need to go beyond access. We need to go beyond thinking simply about getting people in to what happens when they're in higher education and how that works for those students. We need to account, therefore, for the quality and the relevance of the provision of higher education and in international perspective, we need to make more concerted efforts to recognize higher education qualifications. So that's just a very brief teaser on our report, and now Rola's going to do the same for the policy paper they're launching in preprint today. Thank you, Emma. So the, as you mentioned earlier, these two documents are really complementary. And uh, in, in light of the research uh, carried out for the elaboration of this uh, report and the findings and the defi definition of, of the framework, the, the policy paper uh, delves into addressing several issues in terms of access, uh, inclusion, and governance uh, to provide some specific, uh, specific recommendations to, to policymakers and other stakeholders. Um, Enforcing principles in, in, in terms of, um, uh, of access remain an important uh, challenge. Uh, as we know, uh, disadvantaged continue to face important uh, obstacles due uh, to the lack of, uh, of, of guidance and counseling services, but also uh, stereotypes, uh, uh, sometimes inaccessible facilities uh, and geographic uh, uh, barriers. The second aspect I want uh, to, to mention is that state have a clear obligation to make higher education progressively free, uh, yet rising tuition uh, fees, but also most importantly, indirect uh, costs are important, are still in very important uh, barriers, which often lead to heavy uh, students' uh, loans. Uh, and there is also a need um, for multiple forms and, and pathways to higher education. As we know, vulnerable uh, groups may uh, not necessarily have the required uh, qualification. And in, that, in addition to that, I would say, uh, online learning is gaining uh, prominence, uh, and uh, this is uh, associated with risks, of course, with opportunities, but also with, with risks. Uh, when it comes to inclusion, uh, we know that disadvantaged students uh, are more likely to have previous, uh, their previous education uh, experience of, of sometimes of, of poor quality, which affects their, uh, their um, uh, academic uh, performance and can, can lead to, to drop out as well. Um, also subjects uh, that, um, that interest underrepresented groups, uh, education support, and flexibility to transfer to other courses are uh, often uh, lacking, and also quality assurance, uh, quality assurance systems are sometimes criticized. And beyond this, I would, uh, I would say that uh, strong governance and financing really needs to be, to be ensured because uh, we know weak uh, regulatory and monitoring systems uh, lead uh, to uh, proliferation of uh, fraudulent uh, practices, but also important aspect is the lack of interconnectedness uh, 
of higher education with other levels and, uh, and, and types of, of education, which of course affect uh, not only achievement, but also inequality. And finally, I would like uh, to insist also on the, the fact that states have obligations with regard to, to financing, but despite this, uh, and the obligations were, uh, were adopted uh, 70 years ago, I would say, despite uh, this, uh, public expenditures have uh, declined. So based uh, on this assessment and, and the finding, the paper, uh, you will see it in the paper, I would just provide very, very brief uh, uh, key uh, important elements. So um, this paper uh, suggests eight actions at, uh, at national level. First of all, higher education needs to be clearly uh, placed within the wider public uh, policy system to allow uh, for effective reforms. Second, higher education um, deserves a better attention in legal text at national level by guaranteeing the relevant uh, principles and also ensuring sustainability. Uh, third, I think it's essential that state allocates the maximum of their available uh, resources to education with dedicated uh, budget to higher education and targeting specifically the marginalized, the most marginalized students. Uh, priority should be given to this, uh, student, so this groups and students and more uh, widely to the vulnerable uh, groups through affirmative action. Um, higher education institutions should also adopt a flexible and adaptable approach and specific measures uh, that support students that go beyond uh, entry, including, for instance, academic uh, support, guidance and counseling, transfer flexibility, etc., are needed. Of course, recognition of international qualifications should be facilitated and there is need to implement safeguards for online learning and close the digital uh, divide. Beside, um, the publications also delves into questioning how this right can be um, reviewed and, uh, and invites uh, the international community to, to further clarify how the existing obligations apply. The, terms, the term capacity, uh, for instance, need to be re-evaluated uh, due to the unequal distribution, and this was mentioned earlier, um, of education uh, opportunities from early years, but also uh, direct and indirect discrimination. Uh, progressive introduction of, of free uh, education also, what does it mean? Concretely, uh, understanding what constitutes free education would allow for its better uh, enforcement, uh, the extent to which uh, higher education could be made free, w w which uh, students benefit, uh, etc. but also how this principle uh, applies to uh, education provided online. Uh, also, the term uh, equ equally accessible to all is important to be more clarified with, uh, with wide disparities uh, within territories. Uh, Borhain uh, mentioned it um, in, in his opening remarks. UNESCO launched uh, an initiative on the evolving uh, right to, to education, with further aspects of this right being examined from early learning to higher education, lifelong learning, rights, specific rights of uh, vulnerable uh, groups and new uh, vulnerable groups as well, and digital education. And I think the work on right to, to higher education in the context of, of this project on the new approaches will allow a really a comprehensive, um, uh, I would say, analysis uh, of, of the gaps and challenges in human rights law from social justice perspective, and really will pave uh, the way for the strengthening of uh, existing uh, provisions and better implementation. Okay. Now, I think we will start our uh, panel discussion with our four uh, panelists. Um, yeah, please, maybe. OK, as you, as you wish. So we will be starting this, uh, this panel discussion, and uh, we will be asking uh, specific questions to the four panelists who will be uh, responding in two, three minutes. And then uh, there will be a common question to, to, to all of them to, to provide some comments and observations on, uh, with some elements of, of response. Uh, so I will start with um, our first panelist, uh, Mrs. Delphine Dorsey. Director of the Right to, to Education Initiative. Uh, Mrs. Dorsey is a human rights lawyer with more than 10 years experience in the field of right to education. Uh, she joined the Right to Education Initiative uh, 10 years ago and has been leading uh, this, uh, this organization. She previously worked uh, at UNESCO, uh, but also uh, with a number of NGOs, like for instance, uh, 
uh, Amnesty International, Save the Children, and Defense for Children International. So, um, Delphine, and I will switch to, to French now. I will <laughs> ask the question in, in French. Um, pour que to make higher education accessible and available to all, it has to be free. However, nowadays, few education systems in the world provide this or may meet this requirement. What stages, what measures could be taken to reform the way higher education is funded so that it works closer to being free? Well, on the matter of free higher education, I agree with you. If higher education, if free higher education isn't available, it's very difficult, as you've shown, for disadvantaged groups to have access. It's not the only barrier, but it's a major one. Some states make efforts providing scholarships. But in fact, we've seen in a number of countries that there is a reduction in funding for higher education. That includes France. A report was issued on this recently. Although the overall budget is increasing, if we look at a per student level, it's uh, being reduced. So we shouldn't just look at how much the overall budget is increases, but also how it, it evolves as a factor of the number of students. So more efforts need to be made to fund higher education. Also, states have the obligation to fund higher education. The general idea is that only primary and secondary education uh, should be free. But that is not the case. The international right enshrined makes it very clear that access to free higher education has to be progressive. I mean, the financial limitations of states is acknowledged. And of course, uh, priority needs to be given first to primary schooling, then to secondary schooling, and then to tertiary ed education. But failure to fund higher education means that less advantaged groups which have had access to primary and secondary schooling may find the doors to higher education closed, which means they won't have access to uh, posts of authority and that sort of thing. And if they don't have that kind of access, uh, it's very hard to uh, have social justice or a more inclusive society. If we want to have that, then we need to fund higher education for all. So if, uh, free if the right to free education has to be made available on a progressive basis, governments do have to start taking action immediately to make it effective so that there is uh, appropriate uh, budgeting for higher education. So in times of pandemic, perhaps uh, some funding needs to be reallocated to health care instead, but, but it needs to be explained. It needs to be discussed. Uh, that didn't happen in France, for instance. Uh, more resources needed. Well, a lot of panelists have said, oh, we don't have money, uh, we need private sector uh, contributions. But is, that, is it really the case? Availability of funding is a matter of political will as well, you know, the willingness to uh, adopt uh, the relevant fiscal policies. Uh, if we only look at higher education and don't look at the whole education system as a whole, it's going to be a problem. So we have to think of the right to higher education. We have to think of international cooperation because some countries do have problems. So the question is whether stakeholders can really mobilize to ensure that there is public high quality education. Uh, that principle was enshrined in 2009. We really need to ensure that nobody's left behind. 
uh, and the 2030 Action for Education requires us as well to increase funding, to prioritize access for marginalized groups, and to ensure that this funding is used appropriately, fighting corruption and uh, waste. And I'd like to, so that's my answer to your question. I'd, I'd like to end by saying that education is, should be seen not only as an, as, an, as an investment for the future, but a social priority that uh, influences societal well-being. It's not just a matter of training a workforce. When we talk about funding higher education and we think of content, it, recently in France there was talk of getting rid of certain kinds of studies, such as sociology. But we really do need think people who can think about what the society of tomorrow will be like. We, we shouldn't think of funding only in terms of investment. We need to think of social justice. We need to think of how to create tomorrow's world. Delphine, merci beaucoup pour ces mots puissants. Thank you very much for these very strong words. Panelist, um, I've got the pleasure to introduce Laura Genichini. Uh, Laura is a social scientist and a journalist. She joined the Latin American Campaign for the Right to Education in 2010 and currently works for its institutional development coordination and for the regional coordination of the Civil Society Education Fund. This is an initiative that strengthens the capacities of civil society organizations, of advocating for the realization of the right to education, and for the implementation of the global 2030 education agenda. Between March 2017 and March 2019, she integrated the board of directors of the Global Partnership for Education, representing there the voice of civil society organizations from developing countries. So uh, again, Laura, we're very excited to have you with us. Uh, so here's the first question. Could you discuss decolonization and depatriarchalization of the conveyance of knowledge within and from the global south? What are institutions in the right to higher education? Oh, well, thank you very much for this effort to speak Spanish. Before I address your specific question, I'd like to thank you for this invitation to speak here. I think this is an important panel. I can see that this room is not quite as full as it was for the previous session, and I think it's a shame because we're talking about new approaches to the right to higher education, and I think this is essential in terms of rethinking higher education. This room should be packed to the brims. Anyway, so this takes me to a sort of prior step. How can we change our narrative so that our narrative will convey the sense, the purpose of the education that we want for the society we want? I think that links up to your question, really. Historically speaking, universities were set up in order to train the dominant groups. We haven't had up until now a university conceiving of education for people to address the needs of peoples. And that has to do with the colonization history in which these universities were set up. About 100 years ago, Argentinian university students at the University of Córdoba came from a background of a religious, autocratic, and, and an undemocratic university occupied the university saying that we need, we need a different kind of university, one that's more democra democratic with uh, autonomy, with uh, freedom to teach, and one that meets the needs of different peoples and that recognizes the cosmic uh, 
visions, the, 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 the perceptions of indigenous peoples, of African descendants, of uh, marginalized people at large. This is needed in order to uh, meet the needs of a diversified world. We're talking about internationalization in all of these sessions. We're talking about mutual recognition of degrees. All of that is important, but we don't want that to happen on the basis of standardization because we need different types of knowledge in every area for different societies. So we need to produce critical thinking uh, to rethink the so society into the future, not only in humanities. Engineering is concerned as well. We usually tend to as assume that uh, engineering is more standardized, but that is not the case. As I recall, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, which is where I live, we had a tradition of uh, working in the metro system. That was privatized, and then an international company came in. The techniques that we were using to manage that territory, the ground that the metro ran on, were techniques that we knew very well. But then these foreign engineers came in who didn't know the system, and they started boring tunnels in our city of Sao Paulo. And there was a huge pit that cre created because they didn't know how to manage that kind of soil. So knowledge production needs to be culturally relevant and, the, and it needs to be responsive to the setting, not only in humanities, but across the board. The kind of standardization that the private sector in particular is uh, pr uh, propounding really uh, serves privatization and uh, commoditization. And that's not what we need. We need critical knowledge that is culturally relevant, that is relevant, that is plural, and that can handle the transformation in our societies. With a view to leaving behind the, this imbalance of power and the kind of discrimination that our societies have experienced over centuries, including a gender imbalance or discrimination. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. This is actually very inspiring. Thank you. Uh, I will now uh, turn to uh, Professor Tristan McCohen. Um, so Tristan McCohen is a professor of international education at UCL, Institute of Education, UK. Uh, Tristan's uh, work uh, focuses primarily on issues of higher education and international development. Uh, his research covers areas of access to, access to quality and equity in higher education and uh, relates to a broad range of contexts, uh, particularly in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. He is currently conducting multi-country research projects focusing on higher education pedagogy, graduate destinations, and the public good in Africa. Past work also included uh, and, and, and focused uh, on, uh, on citizenship education and human rights. Um, Tristan, um, you, you study higher education systems around the world. Uh, could you uh, talk about the implications for the right to, edu right to education, right to higher education, of a stratification of higher education systems and inequality between institutions? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's great to be part of this panel. I just want to applaud the initiative from UNESCO, ESALC, and the Right to Education Initiative. It's, it's fantastic. And also for having a multilingual panel, which is so great, and also highlights some of the problems in higher education that we have, and it's, so it's really great to be part of this. Um, I, so yeah, in, in answer to your question, I think stratification highlights another dimension of this, which isn't always focused on, and naturally, most of the attention has been on getting people into the system. I think that, that's quite right. That was the priority, that has been the priority. But as systems grow, we start to think about what happens when people are in. And I th uh, so I'm just going to make a few uh, comments on that. And you know, why is stratification a problem? I mean, a lot of people have uh, actually advocated differentiation of higher education systems as a positive thing. Uh, and I think in s it could be. Uh, 
Uh, the problem with stratification, of course, is that you, you move from having a, a horizontal differentiation where you might have lots of different kinds of institutions fulfilling important different roles, and there might be a choice, and, um, to a vertical differentiation where you have differences of possibly funding, possibly of, of quality of teaching and learning and function, um, but also importantly of a, 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 an immaterial prestige which has a massive influence on people's life prospects. And I think this is a, a really important issue for um, the right to education to uh, address because uh, you know, the connection between the institutions and who goes to them is not a coincidental one. And, and, and in all systems, although of course there's big differences, um, you know, there's uh, you know, lower income students, more disadvantaged students are disproportionately in the lower prestige and lower quality institutions uh, and vice versa. So there's a reproduction of inequalities. Um, we expand the system as we go up, but the inequalities have just moved up the system uh, and, and we don't really change that, that configuration. So sometimes it might be a question of institutional type. You know, you've got your universities, your polytechnics, your community colleges. Sometimes it, it, you know, there might be just one designation of institutions, um, but you know, different kinds of association of them. And that's the case in the UK, for example, where, where most institutions have the, the label university, but there's still a very strong differentiation in the public understanding of what their role might be um, in, in different kinds of countries. Uh, that, that, that configuration is going to be quite different with, with, with quite specific types. So I think if, if we're thinking of new approaches to the right to higher education, we really need to bring into this um, an idea of, 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 of horizontality uh, as a goal for systems. Um, not that all institutions need to be the same. We don't need a monolithic system. Um, there can be that diversity. There can be different kinds of institution, different sizes, shapes, emphases. But there has to be some um, uh, evenness of, of, of the quality uh, and, and also the public recognition uh, and, and the life chances that that, that, that leads to. So this is a really important, I think, to, to build into our ideas of the right to higher education. Thanks. Thanks, Tristan. Um, we're going to turn now to our fourth panelist, uh, Mary Tupan Weno. Mary, welcome. Uh, Mary is the executive director of ECHO, which is the Centre for Diversity Policy in Utrecht, the Netherlands. Uh, she's been working for ECHO since 1999, um, and her professional involvement on diversity and inclusion developments in higher education and education started working for the government. Uh, so before ECHO, she was at the Dutch Ministry of Education, Culture and Science as a policy advisor at the Department of Higher Education. At the ministry, she was also responsible for the development of policy regarding the improvement of the participation and success of ethnic minorities in higher education and was part of a team that worked on the establishment of ECHO in 1994. So, Mary, um, in your work, you've identified that many students don't even know if they have a right to higher education. So, could you explain a little more about this um, and talk about how you think access to higher education could be improved? Thank you, uh, Emma, and also I, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And also want to thank um, UNESCO for inviting me. Um, let me start by saying that um, your question, it doesn't mean that students, I mean, there's a reason why students are underrepresented in different, um, different systems. And what we often see is that there's a disconnect between a policy aim on a macro level uh, on an institutional level and what that means for a student or communities on a micro level. And um, because many students have the aspiration or the idea to progress in society and know that higher education or education in general is a way to um, increase in, 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 you know, socially or, or economically. But what we often see is that um, information is, or policy that has been developed, uh, there's no vision on implementation. And so the question, you know, the, the, the what, what we often see is that there's a long trajectory to have, uh, to make the decision to 
focus on access and underrepresentation. And then the next question is, what does it take to make sure that on a, on a, on a micro level, on a community level, that um, students know how to navigate uh, in that system. And, and even in very progressive systems, I mean, I'm from the Netherlands and you know, we have a, a fairly open access system. The affordability is not really an issue. Uh, and still, there are many students who don't know their way to, to higher education. So uh, making sure that the information is there, but also um, understanding uh, some students who have been denied and um, you know, excluded in society because of who they are, because of the different identities they represent, is something that we uh, don't like to talk about. And uh, I'm talking from a Dutch perspective, because we really think that our system is uh, inclusive enough to deal with the inequities in society. So, you know, even in, 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 in a, a system like the Netherlands, we see that having, having the information uh, and how to prepare to uh, enter uh, higher education. And I know there are many uh, countries where there are um, admission systems in place. And uh, an admission system in, 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 in itself doesn't have to be a barrier. But knowing how to prepare to get admitted um, you know, knowing um, institutions that are aware of, of, of uh, communities of students who are, you know, who, who don't have these conversations at the, at, at the kitchen table about, you know, what is, what do I want to become? And what do I have to do to, to get there? Um, you know, is there funding? Um, and, and, and then the, first, the next decision is, you know, uh, which university? Uh, where do I see myself represented in, in, in faculty? Where do I see myself represented in the curricul uh, curriculum? So it's, um, you know, reaching out to students and students' communities is, is, I think, one of the major and the minimum steps institutions uh, need to do to make sure uh, to get, um, you know, the communities, to attract the communities to have, to have access. And so, you know, when, when we talk about um, the right to higher education, it really is necessary to, um, well, to ask yourself, and I, with yourself I mean also on a, on a, on a national and institutional level, um, is this really an aim that you want to um, have, have impact on? Or is it something that, um, you know, is a nice to have statement uh, within, you know, a, a policy? And I think that there's, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of gray areas in, um, you know, a, a statement that it is important because it is, it is um, you know, you, you, can't, you can't disagree with that. But I think it is not so much the question what, what you know, the right to education, yes, but what is necessary to actually make it happen? And to what extent are we willing to um, also connect with communities that are not traditionally seen in higher education? Thank you. Mary, many thanks, many thanks. And in fact, that leads very nicely um, into the question that I want now to pose to all of the panelists. So I'll ask the question then ask each of them to address it in turn in the same order. Following that, we will then have an opportunity for some open discussion. Um, so I, I hope that um, you, know, there, you want to take up the opportunity to, uh, to perhaps follow up a little bit more on some of the topics that we've already touched on. But for this uh, next question, let me ask all of you to reflect on. Um, if you had to give a key message for policyholders um, and other stakeholders on the next steps for the enforcement of the right to higher education, what would that key message be. Et alors, commençons, uh, Delphine, avec vous. So can we start with you, Delphine? Thank you. There are a number of points I might recommend. First, make sure that we monitor implementation of the right 
to higher education. If we are not aware of the issues, well, it was very interesting what Mai just said about the Netherlands. It's a very interesting point. I mean, it's thought of as an inclusive country, but it's not quite as inclusive as we think. And if we really look at the extent to which the right to higher education is exercised, uh, and we don't know which groups experience uh, barriers named, well, we, we're not really doing our job. So, I mean, issues evolve over time. With the pandemic, higher education students who were less uh, advantaged, more disadvantaged, uh, for instance, didn't have access to their university student jobs, uh, which they needed to earn their keep. And, and uh, in the case of the United States, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in the case of France, I mean, there are a lot of people in the kind of situation. So we really need to monitor very closely how uh, the r right is implemented and, 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 and enforced and how it's exercised and what policies are around. I mean, funding is one thing, but funding needs to match needs. Sometimes with increased funding, we think that things have improved, but if the number of students has, has exploded, then it's not adequate. So we just recently published a guide on how to monitor access to higher education for you know, civil society organizations. But I mean, it could be used here. I would really recommend detailed monitoring. And then we've already talked about funding. That's essential. Unless we really take action to make sure that no one is le left behind and to ensure that policies are explicitly put into place to help uh, less advantaged groups, it's going to be a problem. I mean, all over UNESCO, we've got posters plastered all over the place saying, leave no one behind. Well, we have to do, we have to do something about it. Otherwise, we'll just find you know, marginalization. Only just this morning, we were talking about, uh, you know, there were people saying uh, that the solution would be to bring in private actors. But if, if uh, you know, uh, and I see the point, but what impact will that have on on funding, on 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 what happens to students, uh, you know, who have to, who 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 have to borrow <laughs> money, and and or, or or work all night to pay for their studies? It's just unfair. We're just reproducing the unfairness of the existing system. So we need to do to to design higher education to create and and to think to create, a uh, design a more just future society. And that requires us to transform our political views and our political promises and promises enshrined in law as well, including constitutions. N a number of constitutions enshrine the right to education to ensure that uh, if it's not done, resources will have to be made available to right holders. And something that several panels have mentioned, and you know, and then and, and, and it, men, it was mentioned this morning as well, is the new UNESCO Convention on Mutual Recognition of uh, Qualifications. It, it it's not quite in force yet. Uh, there are issues, uh, as you said, you know, enforcement is an issue. I would like us to encourage, to invite uh, governments to ratify this convention, particularly to support displaced persons and migrants and give them access to higher education. The importance both of financing but also for taking up the, uh, the UNESCO call to action as was mentioned by the Director General as well yesterday, so thank you for that. Um, Laura, podrá tomar la palabra? Would you like to take the floor? Yes, I would also have thousands of recommendations to make and not a lot really to add over and above what Delphine has just said. She presented quite a lot of the things that I would have liked to say. But we're talking about education being a right and an obligation for countries, for states. 
and it's also an obligation so as to arrive at a place of social justice. So the subject of funding that Delphine brought out at the outset, public funding for public education is of fundamental importance because when we collectively define what is education, what is the meaning of education, and when there is a guarantor of these rights, someone who's responsible for these rights being complied with, we need to be able to make our demands and say that things aren't being done or complied with. But when we don't even see where the obligation and the responsibility resides, when we start having privatization, for instance, the definition of public policy becomes different. It's no longer democratically and collectively elaborated. And I think there is a central element here that we need to think about in higher education, and that would be participation of the subjects of this policy of educational communities, students, teachers, parents, people who are in the community concerned. And what we see today is that spaces for governance have been occupied by the corporate sector, more or less alone. And that has consequences and implications in, for education and its meaning. And I think reopening those spaces to the participation of legal subjects is of fundamental importance, that it should be free of charge, absolutely, for the future, but a near future, because we already said that being free of charge should be progressive, but we never got there. So this is the time, I think, to make a demand and not back down. And I think this is true for our whole region. And here we're talking not just about countries, but also families. In some countries, the debt we're talking about isn't only for the student who indebts him or herself, but that person's children, future generations, will also be indebted, which is absurd. Because it means you're starting life with the debt of previous generations. And then just to come back to digitalization for a moment. Digitalization is a reality. Certainly we will not be able to deny its existence, but digitalization needs to be something complementary to in-person learning. There is a training for critical thinking without integration, without the possibility of giving impetus to critical reasoning between student movements, for instance, or with teachers. And I think we need to take back the subject of in-person learning and see digitalization as something which helps, which is complementary, but which is not the essence of higher education. I think that's very important. Thank you, Laura. I'm going to now just turn straight to Tristan and uh, pass the same question to you. Your key message, please, Tristan. Thanks very much. Yeah, and I, I think I'm going to build uh, quite closely on, on yeah. things that have already been said. So I think if I were to, and it is difficult to choose one thing, but if I were to, to, to one message, I would say, um, you know, not any expansion will do, I think. We, we, we've, there is a temptation for states to go for expansion at, 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 in any way, at any cost of the higher education system. Um, and I think that isn't the way forward. Um, I mean, we've seen with the fascinating statistics at the start, you know, higher education has grown dramatically all around the world, and it's done so in, in quite different ways, actually, if you look at diff different countries. And I think in some places there's been a temptation for states, um, and linking in with, with the points you're making, to go for the easy route, uh, which is to allow for a, a, either an unregulated or a semi-regulated proliferation of highly commercialized uh, institutions um, with everything from you know, entirely fraudulent diploma mills to legal and regulated institutions that are just simply of a very poor quality and prioritize profit over quality. And I'm afraid this is the sad reality in many places. Um, and I think we need to really think whether that is actually better than nothing. And I think we, we have to think of the right kind of expansion of higher education. It's not expansion at any cost. Um, because 
that kind of expansion has, brings very little benefit to individuals. It's playing into a zero-sum game of, of some people getting a leg up over others, but um, it also brings very little aggregate benefit for society. I mean, we've, and, and when we think about access to higher education, we can't forget about everybody else in society who's not going to university, because they also are involved in, in, in this, the system of higher education. And, and the impact that that system has on everybody in society, including people who at that particular point in time may not go to university, uh, they might do in the future or they may never go, but they also have an interest in what higher education systems do. So I think we have to think about I expansion of systems in relation to the public good function of, of, of higher education. So that's institutions that can really provide the conditions for professional development um, uh, and not just in terms of diplomas, but a professional development that's ethical, that thinks about the environment, that thinks about exploitation of human communities, a civic dimension, um, you know, uh, empowerment in the political sphere and, and the personal elements, um, as well as the impact of, of the institution more broadly on society through its research and community engagement in, in, the, in, in the public interest. So I think you know, thinking about expansion in relation to the public good function of universities is, is, is really critical. Tristan, thank you. And Mary, uh, your key message for policymakers or other stakeholders? Yeah, well, I think uh, one of the key messages is that it is some, uh, creating or, or developing uh, policy to increase underrepresentation or increase representation from underrepresented groups is a multi-stakeholder approach. You need a multi-stakeholder approach. And to me, it is, it is more um, the process. So what is necessary to, to really create impact? Because intentions are beautiful, but it has to lead to impact. So um, having an accountability system to make sure, and, and this is something that, that, that governments can do. I mean, you can, um, you, you can connect uh, these intentions to, for instance, performance indicators. So I mean, thinking about different ways to make sure that what is, um, is intended on different levels will actually, actually um, reach the individual uh, communities and students is, is I think, uh, for me, is, is key. And in that sense, also, less is more. So do one thing good and uh, not wanting to, and, and have a very intentional focus. Uh, because what we often see is that when um, um, a government or institution say, you know, we want to uh, increase diversity, then um, the, the, the focus is, immediately on all different, um, you know, uh, communities in society. And, you know, that's nice, but look at who needed, more, who needed most and then focus on, 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 on those uh, groups and do that well. Because then at the end of the day, you at least have uh, created access with some impact. And so the multi-stakeholder uh, approach. And, and, and another thing that I want to mention, and this is the work that I've been doing with the Dutch government, is um, work in co-creation. With work in co-creation, for instance, with students and different students' uh, communities, and uh, involve them in making policy on an institutional level to, um, because students know what they need. Students know their community. And students are aware of many um, this, um, you know, exclusionary um, mechanisms within systems. So that would be, um, you know, my my last uh, remark. Mary, thank you, and thank you to all four of you. I do understand that it's an impossible task if I ask you for one key message. Of course, <laughs> there's a lot more that needs to be done. But I think you've all done an excellent job in sort of really being able to assert very clearly some of the things that really should be taken up as we think about the next steps in the right to higher education. Um, I'm going to invite Charlene Bianchi uh, from the UNESCO Right to Education team to join us on the stage. Charlene's <coughs> going to uh, take over and moderate for a Q&A uh, before we uh, have some closing remarks from Francesc Pedro, who's the director of UNESCO ESL. So Charlene, I'll ask you to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma, for, for this introduction. And, and thank you really to, to everyone for, for being here today. Um, Thank you for, for the panelists for, for these really um, pertinent contributions to this very, very important discussion. 
uh, uh, before we open the floor to, to take uh, questions and answers, and I invite the audience to start reflecting on the questions that you may have and also maybe some comments, um, I'll just very briefly uh, go over some key personal takeaways from the points uh, raised by our panelists today. So uh, firstly, we heard about many challenges that are affecting the right to higher education. And as you heard, there's no quick uh, fix to this, uh, the challenges. We had heard from issues related to access. So Delphine Dorsey mentioned the challenges re uh, related to financing, which is such a crucial issue. When we discuss about uh, re uh, mobilizing resources, we mean also international and national resources. That it means fighting uh, corruption, uh, tax evasion, and, uh, and this really needs to be a priority for states. We heard also from Mary Tvanwano regarding the importance of ensuring uh, that this information is reaching the students at their level, that they have the adequate information to then know how to apply, where to apply, what opportunities there are in higher education. We then heard once students are in and enrolled in higher education, what, does, what are the challenges there? And we've heard from uh, Tristan McCohen regarding the, the importance of having um, horizontality with regard to the quality of education and also the public recognition because there is this problem of uh, stratification both across uh, higher education institutions but also within higher education institutions. And finally, uh, Laura Giannichini, she also raised the issues of what is being taught, how is it being taught, this issue of decolonization, decolonizing knowledge, uh, the importance of uh, really having this world view that takes into account the, the views of, of all students, even the most marginalized and the disadvantaged. So without further ado, I would like to invite um, the, the audience to, to raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, please note that we're taking questions in the three languages, so please feel free to use any of those. Um, we'll be taking maybe a couple of questions and then have another round of, of questions later. Um, and uh, just if you could kindly, when you take the floor, uh, present yourselves very briefly and uh, try to keep uh, the questions as concise as possible. Thank you very much. So perhaps, uh, sir, we can take you. There's uh, one hand, two hands behind. Please, sir. My name is, um, I'm Dr. Do Pascal. I'm coming from Finland. I'm Associate Professor of Higher Education Management. Uh, I represent an organization in Finland and Berlin and California uh, which concerns issues of how the diaspora can boost access in Africa. So, but I would be intervening from the perspective uh, of my specialty in higher education management. I would like to say I'm a little bit surprised by the, top, the topics I was in another uh, panel about access to higher education, and now um, it is about rights to higher education. I would like to find out if anybody tried to look at Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, what it talks about higher education, and why uh, it talked about, um, it was a little bit discriminatory to say, look, basic education would be for everybody, but higher education would be based on other conditions, could be financing. I'm saying this because when it gets to the labor market, you start seeing that it was not the right, some people had right more than the other. So it is important for policy makers uh, to look at it. We, we are tackling these issues of um, access. I was like, okay, this topic is not going to finish. It's a topic that even it's rooted in history. If you go to the French Revolution, uh, the, the French Revolution, the reforms they took, and why they took. So uh, it's, it's a little bit, um, there are even theories, you know, the sifting theory, where the, everybody would come in at the base. So I think as a recommendation that we should be looking but at other factors that reinforce it, and not to question whether it is a, a, a right or not. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, comment and question. Perhaps we can take 
Sir, yeah, please, if you can. Thank you. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Opperman. I'm from the um, Latin American Caribbean space of higher education. And uh, I must say that I'm very happy that we all agree that right for higher education is still his own. So this is a, this is a right that is recognized by UNESCO for, since the first uh, conference we had in Paris. Uh, the second thing is how this right is exercised. Uh, we, in our region, we are having a, an increase in the for-profit organizations, and I'm happy that criticisms have been made for that. Actually, in Brazil, which is my country, this is almost a virus. We, without, without vaccine, I must say. 85% uh, of our students are enrolled today in for-profit organizations, where quality is doomed or is uh, evaluated by distributing diplomas and not giving the experience of higher education that I have heard and which I agree with in this conference, where higher education is a building up of citizenship. So uh, my, my concern is that some words have been, been used around and has been used here too that I am a little, a little bit afraid of. And these words come when you say that the mission of higher education is the common good. Common good is, a defi is an economical definition for philanthropic, community-based, uh, overtaking pu public uh, policies and the obligation of the state to make them. The same thing goes for public, for public good or that university should be public good and not a social public, a public social reference uh, right. So um, uh, I would like uh, you to comment on the difference between public and common, both in the mission of the university and in the definition of what is uh, a public social uh, right and a public good right. I think there is a difference there. And this difference is very crucial to our region because we need public policies being implemented and which will increase access to the population that cannot come to the higher education even if they have the right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very, very much for this uh, very, very important comment. There's one sir at the back, please. Thank you, Philip Potter from United Nations University. Um, I really appreciate the comments and insights about looking at inclusivity and what to watch for from corporate as well as policymakers. I was wondering though, do the panelists have any thoughts on how to deal with inclusivity from the public? Uh, as an example, in the United States, a lot of these reactionary elements to inclusivity uh, from critical race theory or the attacks on we've seen on the gay and transgender community, they haven't come from corporatization or policymakers, they've actually come from communities themselves. These are often PTAs and they scale up to higher education. Um, so I really appreciate your insights on how to watch for corporatization and um, policymakers, what they need to, but also what do communities need to do to kind of safeguard themselves um, and especially when the media has played such a big role in creating moral panics and stoking hate. Um, so any thoughts on that? Because um, I know we often talk about neoliberal agendas, but we also have these very nationalistic populist agendas that are popping up. And oftentimes, um, corporations and governments are in the bizarre situation of having to stand for inclusivity while communities themselves are a little bit more uh, against it. So any thoughts on that would be really appreciated. Thank you, thank you very much. I'll just turn to our panel now. I'll be taking another round of questions afterwards. So perhaps um, would Tristan, maybe you'd like to give some initial reactions and thoughts to the, to the questions raised? Um, yeah, thank, thanks for those uh, fantastic questions. I, I'll, I'll just give some uh, very, very quick responses. So on, on, on the first one, I think, yeah, I mean, it, it, it can be quite tempting to, if I've understood your question correctly, um, uh, and I th it can be quite tempting for states to focus on uh, basic education and think that sort of higher education will take care of itself at a later point in time. Um, and I think, you know, that, that, that there has been a shift in the international community in that regard because, of course, you can't, 
you can't think about basic education with, and completely ignore higher education because they're so interlinked to just in the basic you know, education of teachers for a start. So I think we do have to think of it together. Um, uh, it's a really complex question, the one on the common and the public good. Um, and I think you know, there, there are some real subtleties of terminology here that we could talk about for a very long time. But I just want, I think from my perspective, um, you know, the, the, uh, an important distinction is between public goods as accountable and public good as an uncountable. And I think that the notion of public goods uh, is used in economics, you know, to refer to non-excludable, non-rivalrous goods. And that, that is consistent with uh, a system which we might not feel is, 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 is very rights-based. I think if we think about public good as a singular, um, uh, and as public good and singular is quite interchangeable with common good, I think, although some, a bit of subtleties. I think there are some really important differences from that. Um, first is that it's a good for all, um, it's, and it's collectively constructed. So this is another really important, this links in with Laura's comments, that it's, it's something that um, uh, it, actually involves deliberation and participation in deciding what that is. Um, and also, and, and this is really important from the perspective of our, our panel, and, and I'm drawing here on Rita Locatelli's work, which is really interesting on this. Um, there's a connection between higher education or education as a public good and for the public good. So we're thinking together about you know, how open it is to everybody, that sense, you know, the as a, you know, so, so all people can, can share in it, but also how it promotes public good outside. And I think if we, if we uh, retain that um, uh, connection, uh, 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 that we, we've got a way forward. I, I, I think I'll leave it to colleagues, but I could say something about the third question as well later, but I, I'm sure others have got things to say. Thank you so much, Tristan. Maybe does, uh, Laura, do you want to react since uh, you, you are approach the subject as well? Uh, to me, it's clear that this right is recognized. The right to higher education is recognized. And we need, what we're missing, is to make this a reality for everyone. And with the content that we want, not on the basis of reinterpretations of the content of that right. So yes, I think that the definition of whether it's a public good or a common good or a social good is highly relevant, but I think we're all running along the same lines. Something collectively constructed which gives the possibility of making demands when this right is not met. To have a state which recognizes its responsibility and its obligation to guarantee this right. And it's true that sometimes we use this language. And it's because neoliberalism is colonizing our brains. It's not just an economic system. It's a political and social system which is subjective and which colonizes our minds. We don't always even realize what words we're using. There is a form of reductionist, economic, mercantilist reasoning going on. And I am thankful for this call to be attentive in this panel when we're talking about this subject. Perspective, Laura. I'll now open the floor again to and the other round of questions. I saw there was a hand here before, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it's here. There's a here. Please. Uh, you, you prefer English? No, Spanish is fine. Or I think everyone has a headset. Okay. Prefer English? No, it's fine. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> I prefer Spanish, clearly. So, I'm, my name is Duarte. I'm a rector of the University in Chile. Uh, 
And first of all, I think I'd just say that Chile today, when we look at public funds that are allocated to university to make them free, two-thirds go, in fact, to private universities. And when you talk about neoliberalism, you may be thinking certain things, but I think it's not just the Chicago School in Chile. The second thing seems to me very important, what we were talking about, how careful we need to be with this enthusiasm for investments in university. This is very important. In Chile, I think people didn't know. Uh, the left in the 1970s had a great slogan, which was the university for all. And the slogan became a reality, not with the left, but with a group of education activists with a system of loans, which exploded. And a great part of the social upheaval we've had in Chile has been precisely due to this explosion of loans that cannot be repaid. And if you allow me, I am a doctor, and I can tell you that appendicitis is very painful. And when you take out the appendix, the pain ceases. But you still may have peritonitis, and this is what we do. It's a fool's paradise here. And this is basically what happens when you have an explosion in the private system without the very slightest respect for the quality or the usableness or the ongoing nature, the durability of students in this private system. And so this thing, which is very important today, and I'll, I'll conclude with this. When we look with the public, it's just what we said before. In Chile, there is tremendous confusion between what are public goods, and it's ridiculous to say that education not be a public good. It's obvious that it is. But when you talk about that, that's one thing. And another thing is being public. And being public, for me, is much more important than whether something belongs to the state or the not. It doesn't belong to a private entity. The public part means not belonging to the church, not belonging to an economic group, not belonging to a political group, not belonging to an ideological group. And which for that reason upholds pluralism, allows an environment for students to coexist who come from very different backgrounds, and also therefore allows inclusion. And I will conclude talking about something that people talked about. When I was a kid, we had a story about an elephant, we told, and people said, how can you get elephants to become pink or green at the Plaza de Armas at noon? And how can you do this without anybody noticing? And the answer was, you put half of a banana for a pink elephant and then for a green elephant. And this is how the elephant joke goes. If we have this thing where everything is public, we will de destroy the idea of what public education is. And this, I think, is what we see. These types of fool's paradises must be dealt with with very extreme caution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for these very passionate comments. And uh, I'm sure our panel will be, have a lot to say about this. Maybe, Does yeah. Can you hear me when I am passionate? <laughs> <laughs> Here we had a hand. Um, can you all speak really brief? We're a little bit late. Yeah. Yeah, so we are running a bit out of time, so I'm sorry for that, but sure. perhaps we can take okay. one brief question and then we can uh, uh, pass to the panel. Thank okay. you. Uh, Virginia Sánchez de la Universidad Oberta de Catalunya. Uh, I'm from the Open University of Catalonia. I'd like to congratulate all of the panelists. They've really raised very important issues. I'll focus on just two questions or, or thoughts I would like from our speakers. Our university is an online university. It was set up in order to give access to those who had been excluded from the university system in Catalonia. I know we have to address, I can't think of the word in any aspects, vale, pero, pero cuál sería? So we have to address the digital divide in so many aspects, but how do you think we can, that can help in terms of, of you know, these different ways of giving access to higher education? Secondly, I was in the Wahen lecture or conference. When we're talking about access and success, I wonder whether we really need to rethink success in higher education. We're always thinking in terms of gaining a university degree or qualification. But given the fact that educational 
habits are changing. Maybe success is not just about getting a degree, it might be about other things. There's perhaps you can have just one last question and then uh, hand over to the panel. Thank you. Good morning. I'll be brief. My name is Carolina Cabrera. I'm from the University of the Republic of Uruguay in Latin America. Here are some thoughts. We've been stating principles for years and years, principles about uh, caring for minorities, uh, ensuring access and permanence. But the question is how to implement some of these principles. Some of our countries are fortunate enough to have free higher education. So we find it's especially important to focus on how we articulate with secondary schooling. And what also comes up is the issue of rethinking the curricula in higher education which is still really tailored to the majority or what has been assumed in the past to be the majority. Um, I can invite Delphine Dorsey to comment on uh, the question about Chile. I know that Chile is also uh, questioning the, the right to, to enshrine the right to free higher education in their constitution. So perhaps uh, you'd like to react on, on the comments raised. Merci. <laughs> Thank you. It takes, uh, it, it takes a while for the interpretation. So uh, this question uh, about uh, public education is a real good one. Uh, international standards or, or rules do not say anything about education having to be public. If we look at the uh, covenant on social and economic rights and all the, uh, the whole series of other texts, there is no mention of that. There's some work that's been done by, by some human rights experts that focus on uh, you know, the, today's perspective on some of these issues because of the commoditization and, and, and market, marketization uh, of education is, uh, and, and privatization as well is going very fast. So there's an Australian expert who says that yeah, if you look at how the treaties were drawn up, you can interpret that there is a right to public education. And that's an important point. Because when we're talking about giving everyone access to education and making sure that it's not just theoretical, it's the public dimension that will ensure that everyone has access rather than having lots of multiple speed systems. Otherwise, you get access to an education system where you don't even have guaranteed access to an education. I mean, I mean, what is it we want? An education or a piece of paper? Some people are willing to pay for a piece of paper, but that's not what is enshrined in international uh, texts. We're not talking about access to a diploma. We're talking about access to higher education. So we need to expand our views and stop thinking about specializing in a specific domain. I mean, if we want to make sure that everyone has access to higher education, then we really need to uh, make sure that, that it's uh, something that's public, as you very well pointed out. It's essential, it's crucial. And something also on the digital divide question. I don't think it's an easy matter in higher education. Digital options give access to a good number of students, a large number of students who may, might find that they're located remotely or whatever. So it's definitely something that opens up access to uh, this right. At the same time, in the context of the work we did with students in France, we found that certain kinds of students really uh, suffer from the lack of uh, FaceTime. <laughs> 
there are, are a lot of issues with uh, mental health of students and so forth. So access to higher education via digital platforms needs to be an option, it seems to me. You know, it, it, it should be used to expand access, but, but access to in-person education or hybrid education needs to be made uh, possible. Uh, and without uh, sort of creating an imbalance between these systems. Uh, Mary, if you'd like to maybe comment also on the on these questions, especially on your uh, perspective from an inclusive and equity deserving uh, groups, if you'd like to maybe elaborate your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, it, um, because a lot have, has already been said, and I, and I think the, the remark that the lady from Uruguay uh, made is, I think, um, you know, whether how you want to see uh, higher education or the right to higher education, um, I think it's, it's, it is important that you um, are aware what it takes to validate or to exercise that right and to make sure that if a student enters uh, an institution, that uh, the student not only um, is able to, be, to, 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 to graduate successfully, but also to feel that, that sense of belonging. And I think so, and, and also do um, faculty. So, you know, the, apart from how you position it in, from, a, from a legislative or a policy perspective, I think for me it is the important, the translation to what it, does it take to make sure that uh, the right is in fact a, a right to a better future, but also a right um, to be acknowledged for who you are as an academic and for who, who you are as, as an individual and uh, to make sure that um, the organization is, because it is, it is nice to talk about increasing access and you know, um, uh, providing uh, the, the right for many groups in society, but um, you know, what, what I often see in my work and in my context, are organizations really ready to deal with an increasing expansion and an increasing diversity of students who had a different starting point than many, um, you know, traditional students to um, which are, you know, often the basis of, of of for whom universities were basically developed. And I think, you know, we are we are entering a stage in time where uh, the traditional students should be reevaluated, and uh, and that it also takes thinking about, you know, what does this, the institution, the organization needs to uh, make sure that everybody is validated for who they are. And maybe one last remark is uh, in, in, in the work that I do, um, because our focus is on ethnic and, and, and uh, racial diversity, is um, we always talk about, I mean, there's a lot of uncomfortable, uncomfortability uh, among faculty to, to, to have a conversation on inclusion um, along the line of, of the dimensions of, of diversity. And I think that that's something that we have to acknowledge, have to be aware of. And, you know, and, and we often tend to focus on, um, on students from a very colorblind perspective in, in, with the idea that everybody is the same. Everybody's not the same. And I think that that's something that we have to be aware of and, uh, and at least have the conversation. We won't uh, change it in a heartbeat. Uh, it will take time to translate that into policy or HR or professional development. But uh, being aware that uh, this is a reality of higher education, uh, a part of the, the larger conventions is important because otherwise, uh, you know, entering higher education is a revolving door. Thank you. Thank you so much for raising these very, very relevant points, Mary. And I know Rolla wanted to maybe have a quick uh, comment. <laughs> Je peux me permettre une petite, petite euh, réaction par rapport à ce que Delphine, euh, ce, ce que tu disais tout à l'heure à propos du droit à l'éducation et du euh, droit à l'éducation. The interpreters are sorry, but uh, their time has been exceeded. We're going to stop interpreting. Euh, en laissant à ta réflexion euh, quelques éléments. En fait, je, le droit à l'éducation euh, tel qu'il avait été originellement euh, défini n'est pas le droit à l'enseignement public.
le droit, le droit à l'éducation, c'est le droit à l'éducation pour tous. Ça peut être public, ça peut être privé. Et d'ailleurs, un des principes fondamentaux du droit à l'éducation, c'est le, 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 le respect de, de, du choix des, des parents et, le respect de, et la possibilité de pouvoir... Euh, 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 mettre en place des, des, des institutions euh, autres que publiques. Donc le droit à l'éducation tel qu'il a été défini originellement, c'était pour protéger, il, a été, il avait pour un des objectifs de protéger l'initiative privée, avec évidemment des garanties, des, 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 euh, des normes, des standards de qualité, etc. Mais euh, c'est pas le droit à l'éducation publique. Alors aujourd'hui, c'est un peu inversé, en fait, j'ai envie de dire. Aujourd'hui, le droit à l'éducation et l'idée est de protéger euh, le public, parce qu'on sait que quand il y a l'intervention du privé, ben, ça nuit à la qualité du public et ça, euh, ça, 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 ça s'étend au niveau territorial, etc. Donc aujourd'hui, j'ai envie de dire, l'idée est de protéger euh, l'éducation publique. Mais c'était juste pour apporter cette petite contradiction, euh, <rire> cette petite nuance, j'ai envie de dire. Pas une contradiction, mais une nuance. Parce que non, tu fais bien de le souligner, je n'ai peut-être pas été très, très clair quand je me suis expliqué. Il n'y a pas... On n'a pas le droit que à une éducation publique, et merci euh, Rola de nuancer ça, mais on a un droit à une éducation publique. C'est-à-dire que s'il n'y a pas du tout d'éducation publique accessible et qu'il n'y a qu'une éducation privée qui en plus est payante, alors le droit à l'éducation dans son ensemble, il n'est pas respecté. Et merci Rola d'avoir nuancé, parce que je n'ai peut-être pas été très clair quand j'ai dit ça, mais... Uh, I, can, you, I can say it in English if you want to. <laughs> Right. Right. No, no, the, just... I'm so sorry, it's because yeah. it's so passionate. <laughs> and we're well over time, so I think yeah. the interpreters have taken their lunch break. So let uh, the film will briefly say in English, and then we really mm -hmm. must wrap up, but thank you. Now, no, just a word, just to clarify, what, because I agree with, with Rola, and I was maybe not clear what I said before, is there is a right to, have, to receive a public education that should have to be free. And of course, in addition, there are space for private education. It's not like education should be only free. So maybe it was to just clarify that, but if there are no public education, and if there are, for instance, only private education and uh, fee paying, this, this is an issue and the right to education is not respected. So thanks for clarifying that, uh, Rola. Thank you, thank you so much. And it's important, I think, also to have these discussions and debates, and that's why the work on uh, the evolving rights to education, which UNESCO is working on, is also very relevant to exactly clarify these aspects. So now, without further ado, I'd like to invite Francesc Pedro, the director of UNESCO ISAC, for his uh, concluding remarks. Merci. Thank you so much. Merci. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very briefly, uh, just three points. I mean, I'm not going to exhaust uh, the... Um, the importance of today's uh, panel, but just um, you know, highlight three, three important points. One of the things that UNESCO does, I would say, quite well or better, has been doing over the past years very well, is um, agenda setting. And I think that maybe one of the takeaways of this conference is going to be precisely that we need to uh, look at the next decade of higher education having a rights-based perspective. So I think that maybe one of the conclusions could be that we certainly need to pay attention to our language, to change the discourse. Because if we keep talking about higher education simply focusing on earnings, benefits, merit, then we are absolutely wrong. I think that we need to decolonize well, uh, whatever, <laughs> they colonize uh, language when it comes to that, and try to um, have a fresh perspective, which should be a perspective um, uh, um, based on social justice. I think that this has been clearly highlighted. Um, two more things that have been said as well, uh, which are really important, is that although we all know that the battle for equity begins in probably in preschool education, or if not before, um, it doesn't end when it comes to higher education at the entrance of university classrooms. You know, we need to make sure that we have also some um, arrangements, um, policies, um, even I would say tailored measures that really leave um, students with the capacity of ending um, with success. And finally, a third thing is also, you know, um, one of the things that has been floating around uh, has been this idea of uh, our policies should be progressive. Okay, we cannot make it free today. It's going to be, as we say in Spanish, mañana, mañana, <laughs> mañana. I think I don't need to translate that, right? So I don't think, I think that we need to stop. 
uh, thinking like that, and I think that I've heard uh, many calls here saying that this is already urgent. So, first takeaway, maybe the conference should be, um, you know, just uh, setting the agenda when it comes to the enforcement of the universal right to higher education. Second point, um, well, inevitably, uh, one thing, one easy thing, is to say that uh, we are agenda-setting uh, bodies, but the most important one is, let's make it happen. And I think that the only way by which uh, we can really make progress is to ensure that we join forces. And I think that the different uh, groups of, uh, that are represented here, including uh, UNESCO, but also others that are in the audience, should really embark in this uh, joint venture. Uh, a couple of things that UNESCO is now uh, in the process of uh, doing is, first of all, following, um, I would say, the uh, example of the Abidjan principles. We would like very much to see if there is a possibility of having some policy principles for enforcing the right to higher education. These should, of course, consider institutional implications and more importantly sometimes, the financial implications, even the fiscal implications, okay? So I think that that's really a kind of an agenda for us, you know, for the next month and maybe, who knows, for the next year. Uh, and the second, which is also very important, is that uh, we are going to launch an observatory about the right to higher education. And both activities, in the case of our institute, have been um, supported or are being supported by the Open Societies Foundation, to which we are really uh, grateful. So that, that is my second message. One thing is agenda setting. Another thing, even more important, is to make things happen. Okay? And you can count on our commitment. And finally, I would like my third message is simply, I have been in many different panels, but I haven't enjoyed any other like this one. You know? So I would like, please, uh, to request that you join me in expressing uh, with an applause the gratitude to the teams and to the... Thank you. That's it. Uh, enjoy your lunch. <laughs> <laughs>